Hey, Nathan, guess what? We were in L.A. at the same time, and yet we didn't see each other. Well, I was actually further south. I was close to San Diego. Oh, really? Yeah, I was in like an Escondido area. I was in the uh, motoring club in L.A., which is this kind of cool, like, car culture country club. That's good alliteration, huh? Yeah, it is. And if, if you're able to watch this video, then you can see clearly behind me a photo of Roman hanging out in a really cool fo uh, uh, that shop that he was talking about. And for those of you who are listening, he's inside a large brick building where I can clearly see what looks like an old 9-11. Uh, and, oh, is that a Renault? Ooh, there's some really cool stuff in this photo. There and then, is. But most importantly, he's standing right next to a Porsche. Yeah, I got to go do a first drive of the uh, 2024 uh, Porsche uh, Cayenne. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this video, at the end, I did a long walk around with my friend Calvin, who does PR for all the four-door Porsches. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to run that, and you guys can do a, like a deep dive hands, um, hands-on hands uh, walk around of all the different models. Mm -hmm. uh, what were you for? What were you doing in LA for? Ah, so that was I, a bad sentence. What were you... What for were you doing if maybe in LA? Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I'm here yeah, to help. Yeah, yeah, you help. I was in Southern California looking at the VinFast VF8, and I took it for a drive. And I got a chance to do a walk around also of the VF9, its large three row SUV, all electric vehicles. So uh, can I do a rant first? <laughs> all right, fire uh, away. So uh, I, was, um, I was staying in Hollywood. Mm, yeah. At the Clinton. Oh yeah, I know exactly. Right on Wilshire. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, you know, I like to go work out. So I was, um, usually I like to go for a run when I'm anywhere, mm -hmm. uh, but this time I didn't know where to run because <laughs> I was in, I mean, I'm sure it was fine in Hollywood, but I, it was, you know. Oh, you can run in Hollywood all you want. You're always pursued, but you can run. <laughs> exactly. So I just decided to go on a treadmill mm -hmm. and here's my rant. Um, you know, there are three things I want to do in a hotel. Okay. <laughs> I'm curious about this. <laughs> it's not what you're thinking, Nathan. All right, please, go ahead. <laughs> Clip my toenails. No, no, no. no I, I, I want to sleep. Mm -hmm. So you want a clean room, right? Yeah. I want to eat. Mm -hmm. So you want a good restaurant. And I want to go work out. Okay. And yet, Nathan, in most hotels, they put the workout room in the most uh, like dingy, darkest place of the hotel. It's usually like some like windowless basement where they cram in a bunch of treadmills, Cram in a bunch of like weird machines I've never heard of, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and maybe a couple of free weights. Uh, and I'm like, that feels so old school. Why wouldn't you like do what this hotel did, which is put the um, weight room slash fitness room on the sixth floor with a giant panoramic window overlooking Wilshire? Is it Wilshire or Wilshire? Wilshire. Wilshire, yeah. yeah. Which was fascinating, by the way. I, I had such a good run because I was looking down on the coolest cars I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you're not too far from a lot of major banks, production companies, you name it. I actually worked in a building down the street from where you were. Really? Yep, at LFP Productions. I worked there for three years. And in that area, yeah, some of the primo vehicles, some of the best dealerships in the world in terms of bringing the cars in and they're expensive, are right in that area. And you're, you know, you go right from, you know, Hollywood, you can go to Beverly Hills in a few minutes. Yeah, yeah. And what was cool about it was I got to look at just a parade of the coolest and the classiest and the most expensive cars. So can I give you, I, I made some observations. So so this is while you're in the hotel. So you're happy right now. I'm happy. Yeah, yeah. This hotel room had okay. a really nice, nice weight room. I'm okay. saying most of them are in some dunk, dark day Well, usually corner. in Hollywood, you pay money to have dark and dingy and usually whips and stuff like that as well. <laughs> but the, the, the fitness centers. Okay. This one was actually really nice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, while I was running, I was observing. So first, my first, I had like four observations. Okay. My first observation, number, I'll start with number four. Okay. Was that there are Teslas everywhere. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I've never seen so many. I would say literally like every fifth car was a Tesla. Teslas are the new Prius in Southern California. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. And I don't know how people distinguish their Tesla from other Teslas. I did mm -hmm. see some wrapped ones. But for the most part, you know, if you own a black Model S in Hollywood, it's like owning, I don't know, like a RAV4 here in Colorado. Or Subaru Outback. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So that's number four. Number okay. three. Mm -hmm. I was looking out for pickup trucks because, mm -hmm. you know, we have them everywhere. Not that many. But in L.A., interestingly, there are three kinds of pickup trucks. Mm -hmm. There are many of the pickup trucks had covers on the bed, yep. which I guess people are afraid of getting stuff stolen. Or, Dude, it's L.A., yeah. So, you know, the tan covers were everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then if they didn't have a tan cover, very few of them, this is interesting, actually were bedlined. Most of them were not bedlined. 
Well, you, that's you. So you can see the trajectory of the bullet when it hits your bed. <laughs> so you know exactly where or, they were driving by. And or, or maybe people aren't using them as work trucks. Okay. Well, you see what I'm saying? I, I see what you're saying, but you are so wrong. Well, then, then the third category yeah. of truck, right, was the ones that are uh, there and are bedlined and are work trucks. So mm -hmm. I did see a lot of work trucks. Like you could, you know, it had the box in the back for your tools. Sure. It was bedlined, but there were a lot of trucks that were just like you know people's everyday drivers. And and I think that the reason they weren't bedlined was because they weren't putting a lot of stuff in the back of it outside of like surfboards. So send your complaints to TFL <laughs> at Roman Micah. So uh, uh, can I keep going? You I can go. Oh, you got more. Go for it. This is this is only number four. Jeez. Actually, oh, number three. Three. Okay, okay. Keep going. Here's number two. You know what? You know it's a hot car. Apparently, in mm. LA, an electric car. This is a one that I think, especially if they bring in the new version, I think they're going to do very well with. And this is interesting, Nathan. Mm. I saw a lot of these, especially in that like Robin's blue color, uh, Fiat 500e. That makes complete sense. Does it? Well, it's a logical car for the area, and it is one of the least expensive used electric cars you can get next to a used Nissan Leaf, and it's a better car in terms of fun. Makes total sense. And then the last observation, um, a lot of Mercedes, mm -hmm. uh, but you know what I saw the most of? Four-door coupes. Coupe. Coupe, sorry. Yeah. My God, dude. Yeah, how yeah. long have you been? Okay, yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. Yeah. And AMGs, right? Mm -hmm. You don't see a lot. In Colorado, we don't see a lot of AMGs. They're triple black, uh, mm. you know, four-door coupes seem to be really the thing in Mercedes. And not a lot of electric ones. I'm talking about, you know, traditional gas-powered twin-turbo V8s. Yeah, they could give two hecks about the idea of having to switch over to electric, a lot of those people. And on top of that, uh, there are plenty of G-Wagons running around. Oh, yeah, G-Wagons, oh, too. Oh, G-Wagon yeah. Central. G -wagons, yeah. The highest concentration of G-Wagons are sold in Southern California. You know, uh, Brendan just asked me this question. Mm. He asked me, why haven't we ever bought a G-Wagon? Because, you know, that's kind of my dream car. Yeah, and, and you, we've been talking about this for a long time. Yeah, and the reason we haven't bought a G-Wagon is very straightforward. If you want to, like the original ones that were brought in here were like a 2012, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and those are like thirty-five, forty thousand uh, dollars $40,000. But I test drove one, and they are pretty long in the tooth. I know. It's, and that's part of the problem. So you, maintenance would be an issue because you can't just go and buy a, a brand new one. Or maybe it's 2004. Maybe they're older than that. Maybe it's 2004. Could be that old. It could yeah. be that old. Well, there was that one company that was converting them to the newer diesels that were used in sedans. Yeah, Remember I'm, that? I'm not talking about like the, the these are all 500s or 550s, right? Uh, these are the ones, the, the V8 ones that were brought in yeah, to America. Okay. I'm not talking about the ones that were gray market in that had the diesel engine. Yeah, those I'm are talking, I, I maybe it may be like 2004. Maybe I'm 10 years off. It's been a while since I've done it. But they're like 35, and you know if they break, they're going to be 35 to fix. Yeah, they're going to be expensive, but it's a dream car. So I say. But then the one I want, right? Uh, is yeah. like, Either the current generation or the end of the last generation, and those, if you're lucky, are maybe ninety thousand. If you're lucky, maybe more. And at that point, at ninety thousand, I could spend a lot of money buying a bunch of cars that I've always dreamed about without buying one G wagon. Yeah, yeah, that's so very that's the problem. They're either very old and like very expensive to fix, or they're very new and just very expensive. Period. And I'll be honest about the old ones. They're not the most comfortable interiors. No, the setup. No, me is, and you is, would be miserable. Yeah, yeah, we would be pretty miserable, and and we have been before driving them. The new ones, the new generation of them, are much more comfortable. And Arnold Schwarzenegger was one of the people who helped introduce them to the United States. And I'm sorry, you're not going to buy one. So because you're not going to buy one, that is completely okay. I'm looking at a Prado that I can't afford. If I can take a loan out, a Prado. Yeah. How cool would that be? And you're buying this in Europe, or you're buying that here? Here, here. There's a ne Prado here? Yes, we saw one. Andre and I, we freaked out. Tell me about this Prado. Yeah, no, we didn't. It's it's not for sale. Okay. Okay. But, you, but you want one. Yeah. So ra why don't you buy one, you drive it, and then let me drive it. Better still, let me drive it more often. But isn't the Prado, uh, what's, what's the American version of it? Well, it's, it's a Toyota. It's sort of kind of like the GX, I guess. You exactly. Why don't you just go to GX? Because it's better as a Prado. <laughs> For crying out loud, what, do I have to spell it out? It's better. Okay, anyway, let's uh, let's move on. All right. Because, so let, let, wait, the rant. Are you done with the rant yet? It was, it was more of a kind of a, just a conversation. So <laughs> so you got to go to L.A. Yeah. Uh, no, so the, further south. Okay, you got to go to... San Diego. Just say San Diego. So south of Orange County. Yeah, yeah. actually, I landed in Orange County. went south of it. So you went to John Wayne? Yeah, I landed in John Wayne, but for some reason that they then an hour and a half south to get to our uh, hotel and the, the you base could have just of operations. Flown into San Diego. I know, and our camera guy did. I don't quite understand how the disconnect <laughs> happened. And so it's wait, wait, you 
flew in to John Wayne, yes. and he, and Cole flew in to San Diego, yeah. and so Cole was like a half hour yeah. from the hotel, and you were like an hour and a half in exactly. LA traffic. Exactly. Okay. All right. Yeah. Gotcha. I, I have a feeling. And where did you fly out of? Uh, John Wayne. And he flew out of. Yeah, he flew out of San Diego. <laughs> yeah, I, I. These things happen, but we were also one of the few people, and thank you, Vin Fast, if you were listening. Who I was able to bring in a camera person. Not many other people could do that. So I was very happy about that part. And because of that, we were able to shoot a couple videos and also some verticals that went on to social media. Of course, we didn't yeah. get to go to Vietnam with them like everybody else did. No, which is kind of a funny thing because I have a feeling had we gone, they would have had a little bit more of an even-handed perspective on their vehicle because the people who did go out there and review it, I'll be honest with you, they absolutely threw it under the bus and said they hated it. And there are things to hate. But the bottom line is that I like to be as balanced as possible. And if there is something good about the car, I'm not going to scrub it by the fact that there's bad about the car. So there were some good things and there were some bad things. So um, you can go see that review at alttfl.com. Mm -hmm. uh, but tell me about the car. Okay. So the VinFast V8, and that's the main car we drove. And it's Vietnamese, right? Well, yes. Okay. So Vin is actually an acronym. Um, and the company is known as, and this is huge, um, they're the VIN group, and they are a mixture of take Amazon, Tesla, uh, Disney. And, and Hyundai. And, and, well, Tesla. Uh, no, 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 Hyundai in terms of that they own oh, a lot of stuff. Oh, they own so many yeah. other things. So, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you have VinFest. And Vin, a lot of you are like, oh, it's communist owned. No, not really. It's actually a private company. And they do work with the Vietnamese government, but they also are working with other governments, including the United States, where they have in California about 20 dealerships they're setting up. And Canada's got like 10 going across the country. And soon there'll be dealerships throughout the United States. And North Carolina will have a manufacturing plant up and running by 2025, building these cars and giving Americans jobs. So there's something to that. Uh, the car itself, let's quickly go into that. Uh, VF8 is about the size of a Tesla Model Y. Uh, probably competes directly with it. All electric. All electric. Uh, only one battery, but a couple different sets of uh, charge in terms of the battery. So 87.7 kilowatt hour usable, they say, uh, battery. And the mileage is something that's been kind of wonky because they've been going for an EPA certification on this. So they have two different cars. They have the uh, Plus and the Eco. The Plus has a 234, sorry, 243 mile range. And the Eco has a 264 mile range. And I know some of you guys are like, well, mm -hmm, that's kind of low compared to some of the other vehicles out there competes with it. And you would be right. But you can get more mileage out of it. Now, if I may continue. Yeah, is, it, is anything embargoed here or is it all? No, 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 it's all good to go. Okay. Yeah, because it dropped uh, the day we're recording this. And actually. if you're wondering what embargoed is, uh, you know, we don't get paid ever to do uh, car reviews. Um, so just let's put that out there on the table because a lot of influencers have gotten paid to promote this vehicle. Yeah, I wouldn't consider myself a journalist if I got paid. Yes, yes. So we don't get paid to review cars. We don't take money from car manufacturers. I wouldn't mind taking money, though. Well, no, we just, don't Just do give that. me 50 grand and I'll say yes, it's awesome. <laughs> I wouldn't I'm allow kidding. that. I'm just, kidding, I'm kidding. No, we can't do that. I'm not kidding. Look, our integrity uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it, is, is everything. I'm laughing, but it's true. Anyway, yeah. so, so um, I was watching and reading some of the reviews and they were not good, Nathan. No. Uh, one of, one of I, them, the headline was, uh, not ready not, for America. That's the Jalopnik one. And I want to mention that one yeah, because tell me there's about a that. couple things. That's the one that really, I think, stung for um, VinFast because... VinFast at the time brought everybody out to Vietnam and they just classed it up as much as they could and blew a ton of money on these journalists and these influencers coming out there. And they spent a lot of time playing before they got to actually go into the car and drive it. Now, Roman and I, ever since we started this, we're all about getting into the car, playing around, horseback riding, doing all this, all this crap that people are trying to get us to do. We're not into. We want yeah, the car. Basically, they flew like three f flights of, of journalists, and I don't know if they were all journalists or no, some influencers. To Vietnam, and then they spent a week going to uh, like various resorts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that they own, including yeah. a theme park, I think. Yeah, watching, uh, I don't know, shows, mm -hmm. hanging out at the beach, and then they all got to spend an entire 15 minutes with the car after yeah. a week of flying to Vietnam. So, but, and, but it gets worse. So we would we would not do that here at TFL. It, it, we would try to get our hands on the product is the point because we don't get paid unless we make a video that you guys watch. Yeah, That's exactly. the bottom line. Yeah. So so you know a one week vacation does not 
pay the rent. As much as I could really use one. Anyway, so <laughs> so anyway. Speaking the, of which, you are going down to the Overland Expo. Yes, and we'll cover that we'll in just cover a second. Yeah, okay, so let me it. just uh, wind this up. So the car itself in this review was a pre-production one and one that had several different setting issues, including once it dropped below like 70%, it detuned itself, it went slow. There were all these problems that the rider had in Vietnam. That car here, the VF8, I drove it and I beat the daylights out of it. I drove it hard. And I never had a problem with it detuning itself. Um, 402 horsepower, never had a problem getting power to the ground. Handles pretty good, but there's the really dead steering. You'll see the review, and you guys will get all of that from there. But the bottom line was I thought it was a better car than the review that was sent in from Vietnam because it's a different car. Keep that in mind. Also, one final note. Yes, you all have heard about this whole thing about them leasing batteries, but you buy the car. Nope, that's all gone. You buy the car or you lease the car. That's it. The car itself, forty six to about $49,000. I think it's a little too much. But once again, go to the review and you guys will be able to see the car. And I go over all the details, including its biggest plus and its biggest minus. And I can give you a hint on the minus. What's the hint on the minus? It's a 15.6 inch screen that does everything. <sighs> no bueno. They need to fix that. Tes but Tesla like. It, yeah, but not, not quite as intuitive as Tesla's. Mm. And I'm not a big Tesla fan anyway. When it comes to the screen, I'd rather have buttons. Anyway. Me too, actually. <laughs> yeah. I would rather have but buttons. But Tommy buttons has recently changed. So anyway, that review is out there, so go check it out on the VF8. And I did do a walk around, a really brief walk around of the VF9, which is their three-row crossover that's coming right behind the VF8. So we should see some driving of it very, very soon, maybe within the next few months. I actually have a question for our, our viewers, not our listeners, because yeah. there's no – or if you're want, if you a listener and you want to answer this, that's great sure. too. Send us an email at uh, info at TFL Car, since this is our car podcast, not a truck podcast. But uh, some podcasts – and I listen to a lot of car podcasts just to find out kind of, you know, what's happening and, and mm -hmm. what's the latest and greatest. Some podcasts spend a lot of time actually reviewing the videos that they've made on the car. I have this belief that, you know, if you want to watch – video just go watch it but mm -hmm. i also know that people hate switching like social media uh platforms right so if you're listening to this on apple podcast and i say go to all tfl chances of you going to all tfl.com are, are probably less than zero mm -hmm. so maybe you would value us recounting and recapping the review that we have posted on our youtube channels um so let me know either at info at tfl car or go to the youtube channel and leave a comment because we read our comments as much as we can if you on this podcast actually want us to recoup recoup <laughs> recap uh the the video that we've done or are you just wanting to go and watch the video mm -hmm. what do you think well, well um what's your what's your i think that we could do a quick recap of those like videos. You, like you just did now. Yeah, like I did just now. By the way, styling from Pinaferina. There, I'm all done with it. Everything else you can watch. I think that that's all we need to do is tell them where to go. And the reason why is because this, unless it's a really big drop, like what what Andre did with on truck recently with the Ford Ranger, that's a big story. And later on in time, the Toyota Tacoma, big story. That's a whole podcast. That's worthwhile. But the cars that we're talking about, I think that they can do their own videos, and we do a little recap, and they can go and find them. This is my own personal opinion. Let me know if I'm right or if Roman's wrong. Okay. Well, let me know if I'm right or Nathan's wrong, <laughs> uh, or let me know if we're both wrong or if we're both well, right. We're most likely both wrong. Actually. So last week, um, I didn't get to do the podcast because mm -hmm. I was in Italy uh, driving the new Tonale. That's right. So Alfa Romeo, you know what that, I found out what that comes from, Tonale. I know people are uh, screaming in their head toenail, which is unfortunate. Yeah, it does. It, yeah, yeah. So do you know where that comes from? It's a road, isn't it? A it's, it's a pass. Yeah, a it's pass. a mountain pass. Yeah, mountain so pass. Like, like, really nice. like Stelvio, right. Tonale is a, is a mountain pass. Uh, and um, I did get to drive in Italy, so driving in Italy was fun, Nathan. And I, I got to confess, I, I did a little bit uh, – I'll let you decide. I did mm. a little bit of a douchebag move. Did Roman do a podcast in Rome? <laughs> Ah, uh, you see my wink? You know, if you're listening, I winked at the camera. So, so, so I'll room. tell you what I did, okay? Okay, go ahead. So I'm in the Tonale, and mm -hmm. the Tonale, once again, I'll do a quick recap. It's an Alfa Romeo plug-in hybrid. That's mm -hmm. the only way you can get it here. Yeah. So it puts out quite a bit of horsepower, quite a bit of torque, because it's got, I want to say, a 25-kilowatt-hour battery. It'll go like oh, 40 miles of all-electric mm -hmm. uh, um, if you wanted to, or you can use that electric power to increase your torque and your acceleration. Right. So I'm driving it uh, through these little cute villages. We got to go to Alfa Romeo's Proving Ground, which was really cool. So we were in Milano. Why is it Milan in English and Milano in Italian? 
Because there are weird words in one language that don't mean anything in another yeah, I, language. Like, you know, you know how you say Naples in Italian? Yes, yeah, Napoli. For, Forenza. Forenza? Forenza, I believe, yeah, it's Naples. You don't say Naples, you say Forenza? I think so, yeah. Okay. I think so. I I, think if I'm wrong, correct me. I could be wrong. correct him. I, I can Google it, I yeah. guess. Uh, well, anyway, But just going. correct me. Anyway, so, but it is Milan in English and Milano. Okay. Because my friend Steve, who's Italian... Said, you know, he texted me, oh, you're in Milano. I was like, oh, I'm in Milan. Anyway, so, so I'm driving this thing through these cute little villages where the speed limit is 30 kilometers an hour, which is slow. Yeah, that's it's like slow. 20 miles an hour. Yeah, right? that's, that's slow. And, and so I'm in uh, the tonale, the top of the line, mm-hmm. plug in hybrid, and there's a guy in a Stelvio behind me, and he's like, in a very Italian way, right up my ass. Yeah. I, I'm literally like, I would say, a foot away from me. Maybe whatever that is, a meter is a quarter of a meter. Okay. <laughs> so he's right on you. Right on me, yeah, okay. yeah. But, it, you know, that's the way they drive in Italy, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was like, okay, if he's being a little bit of a douchebag, I know that the second you get out of the village and the speed limit changes from 30 to whatever it is, mm-hmm. he's going to want to pass me. Right. Right? So we get out of the town. He pulls over to his left, and I floored. Oh, <laughs> you did. I did. Yeah. And were you able to stay ahead of him? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's oh. quick. Yeah, the yeah. car is quick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, then I felt like a complete douche. Yeah, but I've, I've driven in Italy before, and frankly, that is something very common. That type of driving style. It is common you, there, yeah. They really <laughs> like to go fast sometimes. Oh, they love to go fast. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it, which, which works with the car. So what do you think of the car? Um, the uh, car itself is... Um, so the review, <laughs> the driving impression review got some... Maybe the PR team can take this as a sign of things to come, and it's not a good sign. But mm-hmm. the, you know, Or maybe I just did a crappy job in reviewing it. But the car itself didn't get a lot of love in terms of people watching the review. So mm-hmm. I don't know if people don't know what the car is or if there's very little. And I was trying to figure this out, right? So one of the cool things we got to do was uh, they took us uh, on the tour of the Alfa Romeo Museum. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. And then we got to go in the vault, <sighs> see the stuff that the public can't see. Mm. Uh, so uh, that video, I think, is on Classics or will be on Classics. Mm-hmm. I don't want to recount it. It's like an hour-long video because oh, I, yeah. I, I did the whole tour and I just basically documented all the cars. Uh, uh, but, um, yeah, there's some beautiful Alfa Romeos. But the sense I got, Nathan, with Alfa Romeo is that, like, they're um, – so this is what they told us. They said that between 80 and 90% of Alfa Romeo buyers in America are men. Okay. And they're hoping that – you're going to get to more of a 50-50 with the new Tonale. So, th- I mean, it's obviously a re... It's the original version of the Hornet here in America. Right. So think, you know, mid-size crossover, right? Mm. That, that's what it is. Basically. It's on the verge of mid-size and compact. Yeah, it's, it's like, like an X, yeah. X3 mm-hmm. BMW, if that, right. if, that's, if that kind of helps you place it in terms of its size. Mm-hmm. So... Um, to me, they were hoping to make it more 50-50 in terms of sales. And the way they're doing that is by making it a plug-in hybrid, more practicality, right? Yeah. But like my sense for Alfa Romeo is that the reason many of us car guys and car gals have aspired to it is because of the history, right? The brand has won countless Millamelias, has won uh, Le Mans, has won all these you know, races right yeah, now. They're, yeah. they're in Formula One. Oh, yeah. Uh, So this is very, in a lot of ways, male kind of testosterone. Machismo. Machismo, right? Machismo. Right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. But the the car itself also expresses that. So I'm not sure how what they've done is going to make it more popular for women. You see what you see? I see what you mean. I think the Hornet might do better with that. mm, I I, see. Actually, I think that they might, by offering a crossover in that size group, making it competitive. The, and making it competitive with slightly higher end ones, with you know the interior looked really nice in that video you shot. Yeah, the so, interior is really. I mean, I it's, think it's, like, it's very Italian. You know, Italians do. Oh, and there's this gorgeous red. Uh, of course, you know, uh, Alfa Romeo is quick to point out that Enzo Ferrari worked for him, which he did. He did it first, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think he ran the racing program before he. He, he was in the racing program. program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, so once again, I, I'm not sure that they're going to accomplish what they want. By going down that kind of racing pro, you know, racing heritage, and so uh, let me finish my thought. I kind of felt like their 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 future was more in their past than in their future, right? They had mm. these incredibly uh, gorgeous, uh, racy, swoopy cars that they built oh, yeah. uh, that they were known for, uh, and more recently, you know, cars like the Stelvio and in some ways the Tonale are just kind of you know 
modern, relatively efficient crossovers. There's, there's, there, I mean, outside of the Alfa Romeo badge, right? So what they did for the uh, uh, Tonale is, you know, the Alfa Romeo badge is kind of interesting. This is also in that classics video. It's a little shield, and mm -hmm. there's a little snake eating a man. Yeah. Right? Which is the crest of Milan, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the, for the Tonale, they replaced the, the, the head of the snake eating the man for like a head of a plug. So you see the two little... Oh, that, I didn't even realize that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So, that's kind of fun. So, so that was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. But but I'm thinking to myself, like, why would I get this over, uh, you know, an X3 or a Mercedes? Because it has because a little bit Italian. of brio. It's, it's, got, it's Italian. But, and the, but that doesn't that doesn't translate for most women. I'm like, my wife wouldn't give a rat's you know about that. Yeah, I know. That's mm -hmm. a problem. And I, I, I see where you're going with this. Uh, I think that Alfa Romeo, you're right about their history. They built the most beautiful car in history. Absolutely, by far, the most beautiful car. And that is the 1968 to 1971 or two Alfa Romeo 33, Tipo 33, yeah. type 33, yeah. Stradella. That's yeah, look it up. It's gorgeous. Oh, mwah, my favorite car in the world. Yeah, uh, which is which is in the museum, by the way. I, yeah, I'm yeah. sure it is. Yeah. That's why I'm envious. But the point is, is that you go from that to a crossover. <sighs> We all agree that uh, a wagon would be better. Anything would be better for people like performance. But the reality is people are selling crossovers in the United States. The only other thing that Alfa Romeo could build that would sell in the United States would be like a pickup. That's not going to happen. Yeah, so, so let's, look, let's talk about their lineup in the U.S., right? Yeah. So right now uh, they only have uh, two cars with a third one coming. So mm -hmm. they have the uh, Salvio, like I mentioned, right. which is a bigger crossover. It's like the which X5. Which is, by the way, a great driving car. Yeah, and you've driven it. It's, yeah. it. It drives well. Really you know, well. We can talk about reliability a little bit later. Mm -hmm. that, that's a, so uh, then uh, they're going to have the Tonali, and then mm -hmm. they have the Giulia, which yeah. is a four-door sedan, which, you know, we know how much those sell here in America. Yeah, yeah. We actually met somebody who uh, was a fan of ours who had one, and both Roman and I are like, really? <laughs> it's just because they're really rare. They, they, you don't see many of them on and, the road. And, and, and this is also weird, but in um, Alfa Romeo speak, like the AMG version or the M version, if you're a BMW, is a Quattrofolio, right? Quattrofolio. The four-leaf mm -hmm. clover. Yep. Uh, but there won't be a Quattrofolio version of the... Uh, Tonale, because it doesn't, they're saying that for it to be a quartofolio, it has to have, I'm probably mispronouncing it horribly, it, probably, it has to have like twice as much horsepower. Oh, okay. Uh, and there won't be one that has that much. So there, it's, currently there's not going to be one. But I'm saying, if you're trying to sell cars in America, a Stelvio, uh, Tonale, and a Giulia are probably not going to like, like, you know, like, 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 you know, blow up the salesman's phone. Well... I think it's it's about marketing at this point. Yeah. And what they need to do is instead of just being blatant and marketing it towards women or anything like that, well, no, it's, it's not a great idea. But what they need to do perhaps is show a little bit more family flair with it, show an Italian family getting in it. I don't know. Um, so the Tonale I, I, is, uh, because I've dri driven its Dodge cousin, the Hornet, um, and as long as everything's running right, yeah, a lot of fun. And I'm sure the Tonale is even more fun to drive. And I know it has a much nicer interior. So these are important things to keep in mind, and maybe you don't want a BMW like everybody else. Maybe you don't like German cars, and you're sick of a Lexus. So maybe, I don't know, maybe that's the direction to go. So I was, it's funny, I was at the Proving Grounds, right? Mm -hmm. And our, um, our etiquette for when we're invited to a Proving Ground is if we see cars that are uh, uncovered or are camouflaged, we don't like take pictures and then publish them. Right? Yeah. It's like you're a guest at someone else's house. You, you don't pull out your phone and start shooting pictures unless they tell you unless to. They, unless they say it's okay, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, uh, and so I was telling this to Rick that, you know, we, we don't do this. And he said, yes, because our policy is to not invite you back yeah. <laughs> if you do. Good reason. <laughs> but so I, I can't show you guys this picture, mm -hmm. but I'm going to show it to you because I took this picture of this car. Isn't that incredible? I can't show it to you because it's at the proving ground and it would, it would be breaking that etiquette. But That's a spicy meatball. That is a spicy meatball. Basically, what we're looking at is some kind of a supercar uh, that could be a future Alfa Romeo. Also, Maserati uses this, right, because it's part of the Stellantis group. Mm -hmm. But that is pretty. So, so as you know, Alfa Romeo is going all electric very soon. Yes, they are. And so I'm hoping that this this vehicle, which I wish I could show you, and I hate doing this, but really it's, it's etiquette, and I don't want to. I don't want to break any eggs doing this, yeah. uh, especially important Italian eggs. Uh, this could be the next, you know, this could be coming to America or could be coming to an Alfa Romeo dealership, which is exciting. It would be nice if Alfa Romeo went back to sports cars. Yes. I mean, that would be really cool. But, but I mean, once again, the sports cars don't sell. They had, like, I want to say at the Proving Ground, and it's in my video, right? Mm -hmm. Two things I got on my video which are interesting. First, they had, like, ooh, 10 4Cs sitting mm -hmm. there. 
Beautiful car. I love four C's. I oh. like looking at them. Oh. And the eight C was at the museum. Oh, oh. well, the eight oh C is, yeah. is, is gorgeous. But both the four C and the eight C, you know, a lot of the Europeans who have driven them say that just the d- dynamics do not measure up to many of the other competitors out there. I want to say they sold like six thousand four C's. Yeah, maybe. I went to the the first event of that in the United States. Yeah. And I could barely get in and out of the yeah, car. Yeah, I know. And it's, there's it's... no manual transmission option and stuff like that. And there was no cup holder. Actually, there was no holder of any kind. Well, there was a cup holder. His name was Andre. <laughs> <laughs> Andre, hold my coffee, bro. There was no place to like even put uh, an owner's manual, right? No, there was no storage. Yeah, there's so, just so, nothing. So there's like, I mean, obviously Italians build cars. And this is a lesson Ferrari has learned, right? You can build very Italian and very unpractical and ungamely in some ways cars as long as they're beautiful but you'll sell a lot more of them if you actually put in cup holders yeah throwing cup holders or in ferrari's case recently another set of doors and i guarantee you that new that ferrari build is going to sell parasangue and per, a thoroughbred Persang is it per or per, per sangue? Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so the, uh, basically, they said it sold uh, out for two years. Yeah, exactly. See, uh-huh. that's exactly the point. You know, are are any other regular sports cards sold out like that? So that type of excitement and so, everything else. So, no. so I would, if you were to ask me, and this is going way back to like, what do I think of the car? I think it's just another, in this case, Alfa Romeo plug-in hybrid, which five years ago would have been exciting. Yeah, I think they're a little late to the party. It would have been great if they were earlier. And I know I know for a fact that both the Dodge guys and the Alpha guys are really, really ticked off that they have to share a platform. They were not happy about it, both sides. Yeah, both. Yeah, I think both. And, and that's, you know, unfortunately. So That's part of the deal. Yeah, so uh, Dodge uh, is part of Stellantis. Uh, Alfa Romeo's part of Stellantis. Mm-hmm, which and, means that they're under one roof. And Dodge has, you know, no cars right now because the Charger Challenger are going away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is the first new car, all new car in eight years or more. Yeah. So, uh, obviously, if you platform share, it's a lot cheaper. Mm-hmm. Uh, but going back to Alfa Romeo, which is a brand that, I, you know, I, I am deeply passionate about because it does, you know, instill this incredible passion. I think that they need something... Uh, like a halo car. Yeah. You need, you need, you need, you need a, like you would have said, a more spicy meatball than Yeah, that, that, you need uh, the, something to bring them in. They're may, they'll probably not buy it, but they want to see it at a show. Yeah. You know, but I'll be honest with you. Get the I, blood boiling. I, I, this is where I think you and I differ. I've driven several Stelvios, including the non-quadrifolio, the regular one. And I think they're fantastic driving cars. They're beautiful inside. I would own one. I know I would regret it. Let me put it to you this way, okay? All right, I'm going to share a secret with them, all right? Okay, go and for yeah, it. I've told you this I'm listening, yeah. All right. Italian cars are like Italian food. They look good. They smell good. They obviously taste good. If you could look at an Italian car, I wouldn't recommend it. But anyway, but it's like everything. It makes you feel good, but it's not good for you. Uh, well, you know, that was big. Well, let's talk about the elephant in the room. That was really the problem with Julia, right? When it came here, uh, they had all <laughs> kinds of teething problems, and people bought them or leased them, and they broke, and yeah. they broke some more. And, you know, Fiat had this problem, too. It's like, remember when we did our first Fiat review, the very first comment was, fix it again, Tony. Yeah. Even after 30 years of not being in the country. It comes back, and people are immediately on them about that. Right, right. And, th- and then, so the one thing you got to get right is that, and both with Fiat and, I fear, with uh, Alfa Romeo uh, with the Julia, they did not get that right. Correction. The Fiat, the base model Fiat 500 actually has half decent reliability, but all of the other 500s that Fiat built in, uh, and sold in the United States, not so much. With Alfa Romeo, yeah, he's absolutely right. Every single one has had some reliability issues, but now that they've been back for a little while, maybe they've improved a little bit. I and, don't know. And I want to thank uh, especially Nick and Rick for putting out an incredible program where what they did was, and you'll know this too, right? Mm. The best programs for us video people are where you have a location like the Proving Ground and you just give us the keys to the car and let us do what we want to do. Yes. And then we can create as much content and as much creative content as possible. The worst thing that we have to do is get in the car and drive and drive and drive because every mile I'm driving, I'm thinking to myself, I should be filming this car. Yeah, exactly. One of the hardest things is, I mean, you guys probably take it for granted. Some of you do. Just seeing the car pass by the camera means that we have to hop out, set up, get the car to pass a couple times, then hop back in. Not get hit by by traffic. Yeah, get hit by traffic. One of our friends got hit horribly by traffic. True true that, Um, yeah. Doing the same thing, yeah. Yeah, and so we have to do that again and again and again and get it right and make it look decent and at the same time get our impressions and at the same time get all the details that you guys need to make an informed decision. That takes a lot of time. So... The fact that the Stellantis guys know, and most of them have worked with us really hard to make sure we get this, they understand 
we need time with the car. By the way, to be fair, VinFast, I told them that I was not going to go on their, their little loop they wanted me to go on. I needed to do my own thing. No argument. Go ahead and take the car. Yeah. That's, so that was nice. So I, I'm, I'm always grateful for when they allow us to do that. And I'm mm-hmm. even more grateful when they allow us to bring a videographer. Like as a, as a, as a <laughs> video or broadcast journalist, not having your own videographer is like denying a print journalist their laptop. That's, yeah. that's how important it is. And some manufacturers will be like, well, we have our own team. Mm-hmm. But I promise you, I've had, oh my gosh, beyond train wrecks working with these teams. And, and you know, what, what ends up happening is they're either not around when you need them because mm-hmm. somebody else is using somebody them. Somebody else is using them. Right. Or, or um, I, I can tell you a story about the Bentley where that happened to me. It was yeah. incredible. Or uh, they uh, don't use the same gear that we have. Uh, so the the video, like the, the you know you 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 know we just we, we don't do uh, what's that called where you don't color uh, match the video uh, uh, color correct yeah it's white, raw white we don't balance. do raw video okay because, raw video. because it takes too much time yeah and so you'll get these ginormous files which are almost un like transferable outside of like actually having a computer that you can plug into right uh, so the, the files are too huge or it takes them a long time to get those files we pride ourselves on you know you saw it first on the fast lane car or truck. Right. Uh, so there are all these issues that, that working with these crews. So we, we, we would rather not work with them. Or what the other thing they'll do is they'll, they'll get video teams that will take really good, much better B-roll of the car than we have. Mm-hmm. But the problem with that is this is an old broadcasting is if you can go to one of our competitors and see the same video, why would you come to us? Exactly. It screws up everything, including your viewership and SEO and you name it. It can cause a lot of problems. So bottom line is that we prefer doing it on our own. Yeah, with and our we work well. We, know, we have a f- workflow mm-hmm. that the videographers know. And we can, you know, if you allow us to bring, and I'm talking to you manufacturers, a videographer, not only will the content be better, not only won't we be grumpy because we've now spent eight hours driving a vehicle and the sun is going down and we have to try to crank out, you know, some kind of a half-assed review before it gets dark. Right. So we won't be grumpy. So you're probably going to get a better review out of it, but you're also going to get a lot more content because we have eight YouTube channels we try to fill. Uh, you know, our TikTok is blowing up over yeah. a million, right? Yeah. All the shorts we got to do for YouTube as well. Uh, not to mention, of course, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. And none of that can happen if I have to go shoot it myself because I'm a really bad videographer. I'm worse. <laughs> or, or you know, if I'm working with, with some team that you've brought in that, that, you know, will get me the video in two days. Yeah. Or longer. It, it, that's the reality of it. So we got to do two gra- uh, rants today, which is great. Okay, um, no more ranting. So tell me about, you're going to the Overland Expo. Yes, so we're, we're going to end up on, on this because from here, we're going to toss to your walk around with the Porsche. Yeah, tell me about the um, Overland Expo. So Overland Expo is coming up very, very soon. And Andre and I are both going to be there, but we're going in two totally different ways. Andre is flying from Hawaii straight to the Overland Expo in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, and there's going to be a big reveal that he's going to be taking care of from that point, hey, right? Guess, guess what I had for lunch? Hmm. Taco. Oh, I did, did yeah. you now? Okay. I had a taco. It was delicious. Interesting. Yeah. It's not even Tuesdays. No, no, no. I had no. one today. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so anyway. So yeah, um, so we'll be flying from this reveal. Yes, to another reveal, <laughs> which is the same thing. Um, so anyway, but that's what Andre is going to be torched. I'm going to put him on a whole bunch of like, you know, energy drinks and coffee. So when he's in front of the camera, when I'm with him, he'll be freaking out. It'll be great. Anyway, I'm driving from here in a Honda Pilot Trail Sport. Thank you. And Honda's another, another one that gives us... Honda has been awesome. Awesome. Too, awesome yeah. to work with. Thank you, Carl. So we're going to take that Trail Sport. I'm going to load it up with a whole bunch of stuff for overlanding, and I'm going to overland it from here, kind of a mixture of overlanding and highway driving, all the way out to Flagstaff. I'm going to hit uh, Moab, Utah, take it off-road there. I'm going to go to the uh, Grand Canyon, going to the South Rim, and then wind up in Flagstaff so Andre and I can meet at the same time cover the, the event, and then I'll drive it back home, and he'll fly back home. So, so if you guys are going to be at the Overland Expo, uh, look for Andre and Nathan. Yeah. They, they will be walking around. I don't think we're doing an official meet and greet, but they'll be there. We'll be there, yeah. and uh, we'll, uh, I'll try to remember to bring some swag with you. Yeah, well, I'll give you some stickers. Yeah, yeah. stickers. Yeah, bring some stickers so, with you. So by all means, come out and say hi. Um, I promise you that... You don't bite? I, I don't bite. Andre might be freaking out. I, it's going to be great, because he's totally he's doing like three red eyes on a row to get there. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Yeah, so, um, and we'll also do a complete walk around, right? You guys oh, are yeah. going to do a complete walk around of the Overland Expo. Mm-hmm. And we're going to have a uh, Trailhound there, our Ram 2500 that we've now converted to the ultimate overlanding race. Trailhound's going to be there as well? Yeah, yeah. Oh, far out. Yeah, they're, they're taking him down there to show off. Oh, cool. The Fox guys are, so. Okay, well, there, then there you go. So we'll probably hang out there sort of like our yeah, base. Yeah, because you'll be at the Fox. Yeah, look, look for him at the Fox booth because Trailhound will be there. And maybe what we could do is 
once you guys are down there, because we don't know exactly the, you know, there's still a lot of moving pieces, but yeah. once you're down there, maybe we'll announce, like, on all TFL where you guys are at. So yes. if people want to come by and shake your hand. And, and we'll be there for more than one day, too. We'll, yeah. be, we'll definitely be there for at least two days. So you're going to be able to see us even if you come the second day. Anyway, so uh, I think we should transition from here. By the way, thank you for uh, the Patreons for supporting us. Without you, we couldn't be doing this. But I wanted to transition over to your Porsche experience. Yeah. Uh, so, and here's another question I have for you if you want to send me another answer. Uh, what we've been doing recently is we have this podcast basically is in two locations, right? Mm -hmm. It's on all your favorite podcast locations. So like Spotify and Apple Podcasts, right, right. right, all there. But we also have TFL Talk, which is our YouTube podcast channel. Now to make it more interesting for our viewers, we've been trying to do more walk arounds. So maybe we'll do that for the next one when you do the walk around, yeah. right? So, so it's video that you can listen to like a podcast, but if you're watching it, you can also see what we're talking about. And, that, yeah. and so I, I want to know if like, if you guys who listen to this find that distracting because we're out in the field actually doing, a, you just did one with three pickup trucks. Yeah, we did with three pick, and also I did one with Tommy with the with Prius. With Prius, yeah, that was last yeah. week's, yeah. And you know, I, I, we're getting mostly positive reviews on that and from you guys saying that you like that, but I want to make sure that the people who are listening, that we're being clear enough and descriptive in the right ways so that you can listen to it and enjoy it. So Calvin uh, from Porsche, thank you, Calvin, uh, flew me and uh, uh, Tommy out uh, mm -hmm. to review the 2024 new uh, Taycan. Right. Uh, sorry, Taycan. Cayenne. Yeah. I keep making that mistake. Cayenne. Yeah, but it and just actually doesn't the look like it. No, the Taycan was there too, but yeah. the, 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 the Cayenne. Uh, we got to drive it. Uh, and what I decided to do was, as part of this podcast, I did a very informal, so this is not like, you know, you know what I mean? Right. You know, it's not like, dear sir, let me, because I've become kind of good friends with Calvin. He came from the journalism world. Uh, and so I decided to do a very kind of low key walk around of the vehicle to show all the different variants. Uh, this one that we're looking at behind us is the $196,000, basically Jeez. Porsche version of the Urus or the Audi, right? Right, But right. there's also an entry level. There's also a, a plug-in hybrid. Mm -hmm. So we did a walk around of all of those and kind of just had a fun chatting about the cars we saw. Uh, at the Motor Club. Uh, so uh, let's go to that video uh, and um, yeah, we'll see you guys next week. Enjoy. Ciao. Hey guys, I'm here at the Motor and Club in LA checking out the new Porsche Cayenne Turbo GT with Calvin Kim. What's your title, Calvin? I'm the product spokesperson for the Cayenne, the Macan, the Panamera, and the Taycan. All four-door Porsches? All four-doors. And uh, Calvin and I have known each other for quite a number of years now. Uh, he's a big off-road enthusiast. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he's done both. He's been both on the company side, in this case Porsche, and used to work as a journalist at Edmunds, right? Yeah, Edmunds and Northern Track. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so he's kind of seen both sides of the uh, fence, so we're going to be talking just a casual conversation about what it's like to do your job. But, you know, since we got you here and we got the brand new 2024 Cayenne, uh, and this happens to be the top of the line, uh, $196,000, yeah. 650 horsepower, oh, 0 yeah. to 60 in 3.1 seconds. Yeah. Uh, you know, monster. Uh, tell me about this. So, so what have you guys done to make it better, greater, and all that good stuff? A lot. Yeah? Uh, I mean, basically, no stone left unturned from a performance perspective. Now, obviously, from a visual perspective, it's a kind coupe. Um, it's got its own bespoke front fascia. Uh, it's got more aerodynamic elements. At the back, it has a uh, little spoiler up at the top. That's and, cool. I like this little guy. Yeah, the spoiler's got little end plates yeah, yeah, on it. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Is, would you call that a spoilet? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, you know, the way I look at it, does, does it, is the airflow affected by it? Yes, absolutely. So it's a spoiler of some kind, you know. And I'm sure this being Porsche and this having a top speed of what, 189? You know what? I actually don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Take my word for it. I'm sure this actually is functional. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's, uh, not just, it's not just there like those little shark's teeth. <laughs> well, exactly, and you know, this car uh, has uh, significant credibility at tracks. It's got, I think this is still the current Nürburgring track holder for an SUV. Um, it also has a taller little ducktail uh, spoiler compared to the regular Cayenne Coupes. You know what I love? Um, I, I, yeah. lo I love the dual exhaust. That's yeah. very 911-ish. Very 911-ish. Yeah. They're titanium. They're so lightweight. And, I, you know, there's a certain sound that titanium exhausts make compared to stainless steel. Um, they just have a certain timber to it. And so even if you have... Now, our sport exhausts sound great, but even when you have a sport exhaust car versus the Turbo GT, the Turbo GT just has a certain tone. And this is also very 911 esque right? You've yeah. Got this, you've got this the wide bar. The, the wide bar that comes across. Yeah. That, that used to be the way that you would know that uh, your 911 was all-wheel drive. Um, and 
interesting note, all our kinds are all-wheel drive, so yeah, it's totally right at home. Now, Tommy, who's behind the camera, asked this question, and I thought it was an interesting question. So obviously, Turbo GT, and if it were a 911, right, the GT has a specific connotation, yes. like RS does. So does that same, and the connotation is it's the most track-focused, yes. right, version of the car. Does that the same thing here with the, uh, with the Cayenne? From our perspective, yes. Okay. Now, it's not made in the same place that GT3s are made. That's okay. Um, the bottom line is, is this car w has been put through the ringer by those same engineers. They've massaged a pre-existing platform to be better than the sum of its parts. So therefore, it proudly wears the GT name. Now, hypothetically, if this was right along the, the, the assembly line with RSs and GT4s and stuff, I'm sure they could have it be a real one. But from our perspective, for what the Cayenne is meant to do and for the customer that wants something like this, it's more than enough. Um, in fact, with the changes that we've made for the 24 model year, it's even more dynamic, more grip, more performance, more everyday usability, more customization. So, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to complain. So one of the things Porsche does, uh, which is, you know, some people call it brilliant, some people call it uh, uh, very uh, expensive. Yeah. That is, you can, you know, customize your car to however you like it. Yeah. So, for instance, you can change the color of the exhaust tips, right? Can yeah. you do that on, on, a, on a Cayenne as well? You, you absolutely can. Now, not on a Turbo GT, because right. the Turbo GT has its own exhaust system. Yep. But, like, say, on the S models or even the E-Hybrid, you can get it in a dark bronze, you can get it in stainless steel, polished, polished steel, I should say. Um, and so, yeah, there's the options for everything. And you can debadge it, I take it? Yep, debadge it. I mean, just you, looking at the back here, yeah. you can get the, 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 the fascia here in gloss. You can get it in body color. Um, I mean, the diffuser here is in carbon, which you'd probably want to leave alone because that's the reason why you got a Turbo GT, right? And this uh, is the Fastback. This is the coupe, as yeah. we call it, but fast, yeah, you can got that too. And uh, in case you guys are wondering, the, the, the base car, which has a, a turbocharged six-cylinder, starts at about mm -hmm. 70,000, mm -hmm. so you don't have to go to 196,000. No, no. And there's yeah. also a hybrid, which has a 25 kilowatt hour battery. Yeah. Uh, so if you guys are into like, you know. The plug in life. Yeah, driving around on electricity only. But one of the cool things about this vehicle uh, the, are the brakes obviously yep. and the 22s. Yep, unique wheels just for the GT, but more importantly for, for Porsches, the, the, the devil's in the details, unique tires for the Turbo GT. And they're different from the 23 Turbo GT. Really? They're taller, they're uh, they have a different compound. And so if you've got a previous gen Turbo GT, you know, be sure to look out for the specific end spec rating because it's, they're different. So they're, but they're P0s. They're both, yep. Um, and then um, I'm just gonna open the door, it's kind of dark and I don't know if people can see very much, but the interior has also been upgraded and it's, it's, it's more of a, a, a Taycan interior, right? Yeah, it's, uh, I like to, th you know, a simple way to look at it is, is if you got an, if a 911 and a Taycan had a baby, it would ah. be this interior. So. I mean, you guys are familiar with classic 911s, so you probably can identify the wide dash, kind of the instrument panel um, layout uh, that, that, that are, that's prevalent in a lot of 911s. But then you intersperse the Taycan elements, such as the floating instrument panel, the, the separate shifter, kind of just to the right of the steering wheel, um, and of course, all the glass displays. And of course, the start st stop button on the left side. Yep, on the left side. The start, right? Yeah, of course, just in case. You never know. <laughs> if you got the kids in the back, yeah, you yeah, to church first. Hey, look, <laughs> when you got to go, you got to go. <laughs> um, I mean, the cool thing about this car is, you know, it's a different, well, not just this car, but the cool thing about all the Porsche model lines is we incorporate little differences uh, to just kind of cater it for that specific demographic. I think on the Cayenne, um, the fact that we ha we went back, well, we have mechanical climate control buttons is kind of an important topic. Um, having said that, there's still a ton of functionality in the PCM and the digital side of the car. Uh, even still, we put a lot of mechanical functions back into it as well. I don't know if you guys got a chance to play with some of the mode dial features, changing modes and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, we did. And, and what you know is near and dear to my heart, and yours too, is it's got an off-road mode. Exactly. Which is pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah, and then once you go into off-road mode, it actually has different yes. variations. So it's got sand, it's got rock. Not that you'd want to take 22s no. into the rocks, but, but you could. <laughs> you potentially uh, could, yeah. And that's the thing is, is instead of having to dig through a menu uh, to, to activate those sub-routines, those sub-functions, now like, it's smart enough to go, hey, look, you're going to off-road mode. If you want to activate the function, here's a pop-up, pick it right here. So, so one of the things we were talking about is 
uh, as part of your job, you get to pick the cars <laughs> that come into the press fleet, yeah. and you can now have an influencer fleet. Yep. So is that fun, being able to like go and configure it and then call up and say, I need an allocation for this, right. and, and actually getting it, and then you deal with all of the other associated stuff? It's, it's absolutely fun. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, I'm tr I try to build cars that highlight specific as attributes or functions. Um, you know, if we're building a car to go up Ophir Pass in Colorado. Which you did. Which we did. With Tommy, yeah. With Tommy. Cool. Uh, it's going to look a little bit differently than a car that's based out of here for like the Buff Book magazine testing, right? Um, and so just being, being mindful of how the cars are used um, and in what context, it, I think that's really the, the key. Um, it, keeps, it keeps the cars honest, you know? Um, and you know we don't want to build cars unnecessarily. Um, you know, uh, as our as our product as our uh, manufacturing and vehicle distribution guys say, it's, it's all about cars for the customer, not so much for us. So, uh, you know, if we don't need to make five cars, if we can do two cars instead of five, then everyone's happy, including our customers. So, is Porsche um, looking more at potential off-road? Because right now you've got the 911 Dakar, right? Right. So that, that that's more off-roady. This has an off-road mode. I remember mm -hmm. the very first generation which came out, what, 2002, right? Yeah. That had a really uh, great off-road package. Yes. Is there, is there a, a push to go back to, to kind of overlanding or off-roading? I mean, there's a, there's a car over there with a rooftop tent. Right. I mean, people are going to slap a roof. I'm not saying they're going to do it on the, on the, on the Turbo GT, GT, no. Right. But, on, on, you know, maybe on a hybrid or on, on, on a, a S or S, something. Yeah, exactly. yeah, You know, honestly, absolutely. We, we announced, uh, we announced um, a rooftop tent availability back early uh, or late last year. Um, we, did, we debuted it at the LA Auto Show back in 22. And, you know, people kind of at one point laughed a bit, like, who the heck? But then at the same time, they're like, well, yeah, why not? And that's what we like to see. You know, a lot of our cars have roof rack capability, like our 911, you can put a roof rack on it, um, Cayman, Taycan, Macan, Cayenne, Panamera, basically every car, except for the open top cars, have provisions for roof racks. And so the, that just opens up a whole nother venue for usability, whether it's a roof box, a roof tent. And so for us, overlanding doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. For Porsche, overlanding doesn't necessarily mean, they mean the same thing as it does for you and me, mm -hmm. right? Uh, for Porsche, it could just be just driving on, um, on a nice dirt road to a fishing location. And instead of having to turn around and come back or sleeping in a tent, you just sleep on top of the car. I'm, I'm the type that like, you know, I understand rooftop tents, and there are certain applications where rooftop tents are awesome, but I also like sleeping inside my car, and the fact that you can fold the seats down and it's a flat load floor means, you know, you have the best options. You can do anything. Let's, let's go look at some other colors. Yeah. Because there's two other colors over here. Now, uh, I've got a suggestion for you, and you yeah. think this is crazy. Uh, you said this is the fastest SUV on the ring. Yeah. How about the fastest SUV with a rooftop tent? <laughs> Interesting. That, you know, the, there's no doubt that the uh, weight up top will affect handling and aerodynamics. So I want to go look at this car. Uh, this is the new e-hybrid. Yeah. Um, and uh, tell me about this car. So what makes this special? Well, so for, first of all, it's in one of our communication colors, Algarve Blue Metallic. It's quite quite pretty and it looks really good in the sun. Um, it's an e-hybrid, so which means for us it's a plug-in hybrid. There's two ports. The passenger side port is for liquid power. Yeah, let's look at the other side. I think this is a European spec. Yes. So you may be looking at uh, something that probably isn't going to come to America, but the idea is. Yeah. Is, uh, is, is and true. then on the driver's side, you have the uh, charging port. Now, the, uh, like you said, Roman, this is a European spec car, so this is a Type 2 plug. Um, thankfully, there's adapters to convert Type 2 to Type 1, so we can still charge it here in the US yeah. with level 2 power, no problem. Um, all e hybrids, all uh, Kine e hybrids now come with an 11 kilowatt onboard charger. Uh, you 25.9 kilowatt, kilowatt hour battery. And you haven't announced a range yet? Of all no, of not yet. We'll, we'll announce that probably uh, closer to launch in the fall. Mm -hmm. Um, has a single turbo V6 with a more powerful electric motor in between the the, the, ga the gas engine and the transmission. So this is, you know, people keep, keep saying, oh, the Taycan has a two-speed transmission. It's the first EV with gears. Well, our, hi our hybrids have, have run the electric motor through the transmission for years. You know, famously our 918, yep. you know, has an electric motor in between its V8 and the uh, PDK. So well, I'm not telling secrets, but when we got in the car, yeah. and like I said, it hasn't been certified yet, but yeah. it showed uh, 
46 miles of range yeah. in a full battery. Yeah. So that might be a hint, hint, hint. Yeah, guys, it might be a hint. That, that this is about where you're going to go on a fully charged battery. Of course, it depends if you're on the highway. Exactly. Uh, you know, if you're going uphill both ways in right. the snow or whatever. Um, our research says most that that amount of range is more than enough for the average round trip commute. Now, the interiors in this car are, are all kind of black, but you can you can spec this out. You know, However way you want. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be black. It can be anything. Uh, some unique attributes of this car yeah, is on, the... Why don't, you, um, why don't you point it out? You're, well, it's... Yeah. Tom, if you want to get a, take a look at the dash, one of the cool things about this is the matte carbon trim with neodyme. I uh, saw that. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. We have another car here that is gloss, so you can see the A to B comparison between the matte and the gloss. You can also get that in brushed aluminum, either natural color or black. You can also get that in wood. Uh, you can get the trim in neodym, neodyme, which is kind of a soft gold color. You can get it in a dark silver. You can get it in a bright silver. Um, and you know, the world is your oyster. You know, this most people spend this, you know, a lot of their time in their car. So you should make it uh, exactly how you want it to be. Now, one of the things that Porsche does, and, and there's two levels of this right now, right? It's paint a sample, right? Right. There's that first level where yes. you get, I think, over like 100 colors, some heritage. 64, I think. Yeah. yeah heritage colors. Yep. And then you could do like, if you like this color, yeah. you could match that color. How, um, how common is that in, 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 the, in I mean, the Cayenne? Obviously, for the top the paint to sample plus, I think right. it's called, that's not very common, yeah. uh, but paint to sample is, I, I don't want to say it's uncommon, but it's more common than you think. Okay. Um, yeah, the majority of the cars, uh, the majority of the Cayennes on the market are going to be just either a standard color or a premium color, but we also cater to a lot of people that really know what they want, and that is what they want. You know, they want a car to match their sports car, a kind to match their sports car, um, or something to, to complement it. And so, for us, it's radically important that we provide that option um, so they can get what they want. So a couple of years ago, you were kind enough to lend me and Tommy um, a Taycan to drive from here. Oh yeah. And I kind of fell in love with the car driving it across yeah. country. So we took it from here to Boulder. And the other day I was like, well, maybe I could afford a used one. Cause you know, we buy cars and <laughs> we hold on to them. Yeah. But they're holding their value. They I, are. I couldn't find, how, how do you, what magic sauce do you guys do that well, allows that to happen? We're at a unique period where yeah. we had a huge supply issue on our cars. So that kind of, uh, of course, raised the value of the it's, used cars. It's 911s. Yeah. Those are still on obtainium. Those still are on obtainium. Yeah. But I think the more important one, which is the more critical one for buyers, is the fact that with software updates, the cars are relatively modern. So you can get a first run 2020 car, get all the software updates done to it. And aside from a few options or colors that weren't available, it's pretty much the same car as what's on the showroom today. And so there's no real difference, you know? So if you're looking for a car and there's a, you know, your dealer's telling you, hey, it's gonna take a while to get a 23 or 24, but there's a 2020 or 2021 or 22, whatever, with software updates, really, you're not missing out. Yeah, one of the things you did manage to do is I remember when that car first came out, it had like officially like 220 miles of range, mm -hmm. and now it's much more than that. Yeah, 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 there's been, uh, we've uh, been very cognizant of what Americans use to help their purchasing decision. And even though multiple tests have shown the car, the Taycans can still just absolutely steamroll the, the, the rated range, it's important that people be able to get you know, more comfortable with the figures that they see on the Monroney or on buyer's guides. And so uh, software was changed, was tweaked. Um, we uh, harmonized the tires that the car came with to kind of really reinforce what buyers were really getting. You know, not many people are buying you know, 20 inch summer tire equipped standard models, for example. So, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, the, the one, uh, what, you wanna, Tommy, what do you want? I just want to go back to the S. Too. Right. Oh, yeah. To the S. Let's go look at the S. The, the, the one thing I would say, look, we do a lot of uh, uh, EV range testing, right? Yeah. And most cars, this includes Tesla, yeah. especially in Colorado where it yeah. gets cold, uh, the range that, you know, is on the sticker is usually not the range you get when you actually buy it. And I'm talking about you get maybe, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20% less. But with Porsche, yeah. You get more. You, you get more, oh, and yeah, yeah. you know we try to be we try to make the car as realistic. You know, for us, it's all about customer satisfaction, not just like at the point of purchase, but you know, weeks, months, years down the line. And for us, having a realistic number, one that a person can look at and go, this fits my daily life, this does not fit my daily life, or whatever. That's the important thing. Not trying to you know, win a contest or anything like that. All right, so let's talk about the S. So this is the Cayenne S SUV. Um, so it has the new twin turbo V8. Um, it's of course the traditional SUV body style. This thing is gorgeous because it's in quartzite uh, gray metallic and it's got 
beautiful wheels. It also has the carbon package. So it, just like the Turbo GT, has carbon fiber parts all over the place. And this is the traditional SUV. This is the traditional SUV. So if you value space over looks, right. this would be the one to get the, uh, you know, in case you're wondering kind of the, the range and I've been over these numbers, like I said, starts at about 70, uh, goes to about 196 if you get the uh, GT Turbo. Uh, and then you're looking zero to 60 times. I think that one was 3.1 officially. Mm -hmm. And then for the slowest V6 Turbo, I think it's like 5.6. So there's like a two yeah. second yeah. difference. And then of course you pay for what you click or what the dealer clicks, right. depending on how you decide to buy it. Every, and uh, like we, we, we talked about, everything's customizable. Yep. Uh, this has just a myriad of options. And I think one of the cool things about this one is the interior. So like we looked at on the e-hybrid with the matte carbon fiber, this has the gloss carbon fiber trim and night green leather interior. This green is so subtle um, that, if the, that, if, that if you're not looking for it, you might think it's just kind of like a grayish, darkish color, but I mean, in the sun, it is green. Well, and earth tones, I think, are very popular. Very right popular. Now. And yeah. so, are, so are matte colors. Exactly, and just the way it looks with the carbon and the gold uh, and the neodyme is just, I don't know, I, I'm smitten by so, it. So you're kind of at the, at the tip of the ice, tip of the sword there. What are you seeing, uh, what trends are you seeing when it comes to Porsche buyers? Can we kind of talk about that? I, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, there's... Is this Python green? No, th this is... Uh, not, it's yellow, so. Acid green. Acid green, okay. What, what trends green. are you seeing? Where, 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 where are we going? I think for better or for worse, social yeah. media has conditioned people that you can't just have a simple Porsche anymore. <laughs> Acid green. Acid green, and so uh, there's more and more people that are asking for custom configurations, which from our side is awesome because, you know, a customer that's able to build and spec their Porsche the way they want is a happy customer, and th which means a repeat customer, right, ultimately. And so that's kind of cool. I know that our manufacturing guys are probably pulling their hair out of their head to organize the, the build cycles and the paint cycles and everything accordingly, but ultimately it's a great problem for us to have, yeah. So what, what other trends are you seeing? Obviously electrification. Electrification is you know, a we, huge, we, huge we, trend. We all know that there are mm -hmm. all electric versions of this coming very soon. Yep. Um, what else are you seeing? Uh, digitalization, yep. uh, people are using, you know, I, it sounds, uh, you know, other manufacturers and we all, as individuals we know it, but smartphone usage, I mean, I feel silly saying it is getting high, is getting more smartphone usage, but so we've, CarPlay, we, Android Auto, Android Auto, we've we've already been there. Right. Um, we all, of course, tend to prioritize other aspects of the car, but you know, even we have to get on board. And so this, especially starting with the Taycan and now the this new generation of the Cayenne, there's a lot more of that integration. Um, we pay more attention to app usage. So the uh, my Porsche app is not just for the Taycan anymore; it's for all the cars. Um, you can, you know, uh, pr uh, do plan maintenance with it. You can precondition, honk the horn, which is all normal stuff. But on this car particular, with the passenger screen, you have the ability to stream videos on that passenger screen. And the login is kind of a single sign-on thing via the app. And so you can sign in on all your different accounts on the app, and it will activate on that screen when you get in the car. And one of the cool things... Oh. Don't want to fall in that car. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that'd be very expensive. <laughs> one of the one of the things that's cool is that the screen is actually uh, built in such a way that the driver can't see it. Yeah, it's right? got it's got polarization, I guess, and a macro level. So when you're in the driver's seat, it looks like you've got the shutters on it, and you can't see the screen at all. I remember there was uh, we went on a program with the Taycan. Uh, and it had this roof that kind of had that shutter effect, right? Yeah. That was really cool. It still has it, I it, think. It does, yes, yes. Yeah, the it, glass roof where it would like almost shutter open and shutter it, closed. It's the Taycan GTS. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's kind of, it's, I, you know, hopefully people kind of glom onto that technology and enjoy it. And hopefully we can see it come on other models. Um, it's, it's cool. All right, let me ask you this question. Now, one of the trends that we're seeing, especially on the Germans, is they're starting to charge for things that once upon a time were free. Mm. So like added horsepower, Mercedes mm. just announced that they're charging on their electric cars. Uh, I guess the big story for a while was BMW's charging for heated seats in China. Is Porsche going down that road or will uh, they go down that road? I mean, we kind of have that now with yeah. function on demand with Taycan, where if you, ha if you have the hardware on the car, you can, uh, pay, a, you can pay a fee to add either a subscription or buy it outright improvements. So for example, if you have adaptive cruise control on a Taycan, that means you have the hardware necessary to have InnoDrive, which is our kind of 2.5 ADAS system. And so if you have adaptive, you can pay an additional fee to get InnoDrive. I think the difference here is that we give customers the option to either go on a month by month basis or just buy it outright. Mm. And the critical thing is if you buy it outright, if you ask for a build sheet from a dealer or whatever, 
that shows up on the build sheet as a option just as if you bought it from the factory. And so we look at it slightly different. Um, we look at it as an opportunity to improve the car because maybe the exact car you want isn't on the lot. Well, with uh, Function on Demand, it gives you the ability to buy that function later um, and kind of be involved with the, with the car even as a second owner. And you've gone to over there updates now, so yep. you can add obviously more range if we're talking about the electric car yeah. and certainly upgrades in yeah. terms of the, the infotainment system. Right, right. And let's talk about this car again. Yeah. Um, so, um, oh, you yeah. want to talk about the, let's pop it, Tommy. I'll get it. You, Tommy wants to talk about the engine. So, four liter twin turbo. Four liter, four liter twin turbo V8. And it's uh, all good numbers. Single scroll. Single scroll, dual, two single scroll turbos. Unfortunately, you probably can't see it because it's obviously hidden under. You have to it. trust me, it's there. <laughs> I, I believe you, so I can feel the heat yeah. coming off of it. What did you want to talk about, Tommy? Do you have any questions? Well, no, the old one was a V6. Yeah. yeah. And now they're back to the V8. The, the, yeah. Uh, remember when the, we had the GTS as a review car back in the day? Now yeah, we're back to that. So we swapped over uh, starting in 20, uh, well, 14, 15, 16, sometime around there. It's been such a long time ago. Uh, we swapped over from the V8s to the V6s. We had two different V6s, a 3 liter and a 2.9. And uh, the GTSs a few years ago went back to a V8, a twin turbo V8. And uh, we thought, oh, maybe there's a possibility to get the S back. Um, they did some tuning to that engine. Um, instead of twin scroll, they're single scroll turbos. Why is that? Uh, they can handle more, they're more, they can handle more heat. Mm. And so you can run the engines hotter in a way. I don't mean from a, from a temperature perspective, but from a combustion perspective, okay. um, which helps on emissions. Um, we also have a smarter valve train, so we use uh, magnetorheological camshaft sensing. I can't say that. Thank yeah, you neither can I. Uh, I have to be very <laughs> deliberate about it. But with that technology, uh, the feedback of camshaft position is faster and more accurate, which allows us to control the valve lift and cam phasing more accurately. And then in conjunction with more a higher pressure fuel injection system, 350 bar versus 250 bar, you have a much smarter engine. And that's how we were able to still meet emissions even though the engine's bigger. Yeah, interesting. Uh, obviously, you know, with German auto bonds, mm -hmm. you, you have cars, I think this car, oh gosh, there's, like I said, there's like five variants. So the GT does 189, this may be 179? Uh, I think this one, 169? What's something? Yeah, it's, it's fast. Yeah, it's fast enough for the US, for yeah. sure. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, scare yourself yeah. <laughs> silly fast if, you, if you're going. And, out. you know, from my perspective, it's not so much, you know, for Americans, I don't think it's so much the top speed. It's how responsive the throttle pedal is. And especially for you guys up in the Mile High City, I would imagine throttle response is king, right? And so having the twin turbos, but having um, the uh, single scroll action with the variable everything, um, gives you just excellent throttle response and having more, you know, what's the American saying? Ain't no replacement for displacement. Yes. And having four liters, again, just even when it's not on boost, it just gives you more response. Also electric wastegates, that's the missing ingredient that I was thinking of. Oh, uh, the electric wastegates work faster and so it can hold boost better for a quicker throttle response. I think the Germans say there ain't no replacements for sauerkraut. <laughs> <laughs> it's sparkle, sparkle. <laughs> and so uh, this car obviously built in Europe doesn't qualify uh, mm -hmm. for the 7500 federal tax credit, but if you lease it, there's at least a, there's a yep. loophole you yep. can actually qualify yep, for. Yep, the battery size is big enough for that. So now, now, when will these guys hit the showrooms, or are they already in the showrooms? I know you can configure them already. You can configure them, and they'll be uh, the first deliveries of the S's should be in summer. Okay. You know, don't quote me on it, but Sometime mid, mid July, year. end July, something like that. And then the hybrids, I think, in the fall, late fall. Yeah, I get. You know, I was in the video that we just put out uh, where Tommy and I did the walk around. I said the Boxster kind of uh, saved the company yeah. and the Cayenne made it wealthy. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> so what percentage of uh, sales does this account for? Uh, I mean, last year uh, we sold uh, th about 300,000 cars and uh, about 90 something thousand of them were Cayenne, so yeah. a third, yeah. Yeah, you said from when it first launched in 2002, 1.2 some million? Yeah, one and a quarter, one and a quarter million cars in about 20 years wow. compared to 9-11, which took about 50 years to get to, to get, get there, that. Yeah. Now, obviously different cars, different market, right? Um, and then but, before we wrap this up, uh, people are going to be screaming at me, talk about the Urus, talk about the Audi. So how is this different, you know, besides the price from the Lamborghini? Because obviously Volkswagen Group has a similar chassis for all those cars, so they, they share comp components, they share yeah. 
um, you know, different attributes. How is this different from the other two Volkswagen Group cars? I mean, I can't speak on behalf of those cars, no, uh, fair but enough. for the Porsche, I, I can, with much authority, say that our customer values that balance. Uh, they want to not only have, uh, in particular for the Turbo GT, they not only want that, that credibility of that Nürburgring lap record, but they also want to be able to drive it every day, go to school, pick up their kids. Yes, Turbo GT owners do those kinds of things. Sure they, they go do. shopping yeah. with them. Um, and so even that capability trickles down to the S, where you, in Sport or Sport Plus, it's very agile with all the new tuning that they've done to the suspension. Um, and it ha now with the V8, it just sounds so wicked. Uh, but at the same time, you can put your kids in the back, you can put cargo in the back, you can put it in normal mode and go out on a road trip. And then there's the customization aspect. And so you have the performance aspect, the everyday kind of just daily driver aspect, and then the customization aspect. I mean, that is kind of where we sit. We're, we've got our hands in those three Venn diagrams really, really well. And I think that's what we do better than anybody else. So uh, you're a big car guy. Yeah. You've got a 996. Yeah, I got a 996. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you also have other cars. I also have other so, cars. So before we wrap this up, we're this cool location with all these cool cars. I'm gonna make this easy on you. Let's just like stamp our fingers and get rid of all the Porsches. Yeah. Because right? that's not fair to you. Yeah. Which of these cars would you would you want? Oh. So we've got a Defender. I mean, we have a BMW. We've got an NSX. We've got a Ferrari. Porsche. Porsche is gone. Another BMW. I think there's a 4C Alpha over there. There's a kind of cool Renault over here. Another Defender. Uh, two Datsuns. A Datsun yeah. pickup truck. Uh, a Z. Uh, so, like, wh which of these guys speaks to you the most? I mean, you know, I like my early 2000s cars, so yeah. I'm, li I'm looking at that NSX right there. Oh, the NSX is crazy, huh? <laughs> yeah, I love yeah. it. Chrome That's wheels kind, and all. Kind of blurple. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, I used to have an NSX. Oh, you, so what haven't you had? Oh, this was, this was before I was in the car, car world. It oh, was wow. always kind of my dream car, right? The idea of having uh, a supercar. That's oh, yeah. Honda, or at least at that point. And the, back then, I, I, I sold the business. I didn't have a lot of money. And so I was able to scrimp enough to buy a 95. Oh. Uh, and I had a rule where I would only uh, keep one car. So this is my everyday driver. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the bad part about it, NSX is because of the tow and camber, the front tires lasted 3,000. Uh, and the rear tires lasted 5,000. <laughs> and so my wife was like, <laughs> really, how, much, how yeah. much money are you spending? And then, you know, uh, somebody came along <laughs> and we needed a house payment. <laughs> so the NSX went away and the house payment. Uh, and, and, you know, I wouldn't trade Tommy, you know, for a million years for that car. Uh, and it was a fine now car. Now it's different. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> was Tom. It was also in Colorado, so, so it wasn't grand in the winter. Right, yeah. absolutely. No, I, just, I love it. Mid-engines, uh, yeah, I have a soft spot for them. Yeah, I think now if I were to drive it, it's like there's that saying, don't, 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 you know, don't meet your hero. I think if I would drive it now, it'd feel slow. It would. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, dude, thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to Thanks chat so. and giving us a walk around. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know, I'd probably go, you know, I'd probably go, there's a, come on with me, Tommy. I'd go for the 4C. Just because uh, I think this car has the potential for you know really high collectivity, right? Because they didn't build a lot of them. Can, it's in can, the thousands. Can you fit in a four? I can't. <laughs> I can't. But it would be like a legacy I could pass on to Tommy. <laughs> That's, could Tommy fit in the four C? <laughs> no. Tommy shaking. No. Here's a better question. <laughs> can a can of whatever your favorite liquid is fit in the four C? Well, yeah. And the answer is also no. no. Also probably not. No. Yeah. Yeah. Like your wallet could fit in the four C. No, yeah.